Good morning. In some ways, I want to say that I'm happy to be here, but that wouldn't be completely true. I'm terrified. (laughs) I'm terrified. My groups are usually 10 to 20 people meeting in a house or under a tree, um, in a garden or a restaurant. And um, I would say thank you to Pastor Danny, but I'm not sure that's in store right now. I'm just going to do the best I can. But I was thinking this morning as I was driving here um, in in preparation for this morning, this morning kind of reminds me of when I was a kid and I went with a friend to a theme park. And the purpose of us going to that theme park was that they had just opened the world's or America's fastest wooden roller coaster. And we were all about the speed of this thing, right? And so we go, we wait in line for two hours. And you know, when you're waiting in line for something like that, there are people that are already on the ride that are whizzing by you, right? And they'll pass over your head or behind you, and they're always screaming at the top of their lungs. And you're trying to assess in that quick moment if they're having fun or if they're scared to death, right? So I finally get up there, and there's this feeling of excitement, but then being terrified, And reality sets in when you actually sit down in the car and they buckle you in, like you're in it. And that's where I feel like I am right at this moment. I'm in it. There's no backing out at this point. So um, I do want to say that I, I, I love your pastor. I met him about six months ago at a meeting, just, we were at the same meeting and he led a devotional. And I can't tell you the last time that someone spoke into my heart like he did in about a five-minute devotional. And so after we met, we talked a little bit after the meeting, and he ended up inviting me to here to visit him in his office. And um, what a blessing it has been for me to get to know him. I'm very, very grateful for Danny. I just want to maybe just uh, give you a little bit of background quickly. As been said, my wife and I have served overseas with the International Mission Board. Um, in a total of 13 years, 12 on the field, we've been home for about a year on some sort of a, a furlough, taking a rest, taking care of some things that are, taking, that are taking place in the States. And I could probably tell you stories for the next four days and never take a breath of what has happened overseas. Good things, bad things, most importantly, the things that God has done that we've had the privilege to experience and see with our own eyes. The place that I've most recently lived is it's an island in the Indian Ocean, and there are more than one million people that live on the island. And um, it's a very challenging place to live spiritually. It's probably one of those places where when you get off the plane, when you step out of the airplane, you feel the spiritual oppression immediately. It weighs on you. There's no escape from it. On our island, we've been gone a year, and we realized that quite a while back, looking at government statistics, that 26 people die on our island every day. I left there a year ago, and since that time, over 9,000 people have perished. 95% of them, we know for sure, aren't followers of Jesus. So every day on my island where I live and serve, 24 out of the 26 are going to spend eternity in torment, away from the presence of God. That breaks my heart. Travis County, Texas. Travis County, Texas, people report that 52% of the people that live in Austin, Texas, are, have some sort of religious affiliation. And that extends the, the evangelicals all the way to the cult, that 52%. Travis County, 14 people perish every day. 14 people are going to perish today. My question for you this morning is how many of those people will have heard the gospel? You 
In my life overseas, I've never been so burdened by lostness. Today I'm burdened for lostness. And what I see working overseas, and I'm, I'm not saying this about Great Hills, but what I'm telling you what I've seen overseas over 12 years of visiting churches in multiple countries, including the U.S., churches have become inwardly focused. You know what I mean by that? We're more interested in having church members than we're interested in having disciples. We're more interested in going to church on a Sunday morning and clocking in than we are being the church. We're more interested in building our own kingdom than building his kingdom. We're more focused on programs than we are people. In my experience, my personal experience, I realized over the last couple of years being a part of a Baptist church my whole life, that I was more interested in that yearly mission trip that I took every year while my neighbors are going to hell. I save my money for a year to go overseas and tell somebody about Jesus, but when I come home, nothing. I go back to church, I stand up, I sit down, I stand up, I sit down, I go home. And my question about lostness lostness in Austin to the church in Austin is this. What, What are we, as the church, the bride and the body of Christ, doing about the lostness? And I think what's happened is this, and I know this happened in my life, I think there's... Um, two things that I see quickly that I want to tell you about before we start reading from the Word, and that's this. One, I think we've misunderstood our purpose as a church. We've changed the mission. And the second thing that I see heavily overseas, and most likely it's heavily uh, represented here, is the thirst for knowledge with with the Subtraction of obedience. I mean, just think about it. We've been to church our whole lives. I don't, can't tell you how many times I've heard the story of the Battle of Jericho, or David and Goliath, or Daniel and the Lion. I've heard the story. I know the stories. You know the stories. We read the best selling authors, we attend Bible studies and Sunday school. Yet when it comes to obedience, I've learned in my own life that I only do things that are comfortable and things that aren't costly. And if I do things that are only comfortable and not costly, I'm not following a biblical definition of a disciple. Jesus never talked about our comfort. The good news, there's hope for us today. Hope is not lost. And I feel like opportunity awaits us. I guess when I'm... A few years ago, I'll just say that I was in a meeting. And I was desperate. We weren't seeing fruit. We were working hard involved in all kinds of projects, humanitarian things and educational projects. and We just weren't seeing fruit. And I was desperate for God to move among the people that I had went to reach. But I just didn't know how to do it. So I went to a meeting in India. And in that meeting, first God broke my heart because my focus and my mission were wrong. And secondly, he gave me a new vision and a new mission. And when I left India and returned back to the island, my life was changed. And I can only say to you that it changed in a very good way 
And at the same time, we have never been under so much persecution in, in our entire lives. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. But it's also brought the most joy and fulfillment I've ever experienced. When I look at the, the uh, Webster Dictionary for the word disciple, it says something to the effect of a, a person that accepts and spreads the message of another person. Ex- person who accepts and spreads the message of another person. And I guess the question that comes from that is, whose message do we spread? I mean, we talk about our favorite sports teams. College football started yesterday. We, talk, we can talk about them day in, day out. We talk about our favorite movies and TV shows, our favorite restaurants. Yet Jesus, he's our best kept secret. In the Gospels, Jesus says, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say, follow me, then y'all, I want you to go sit in the pew of a church on Sundays. That wasn't his ultimate goal for us. His ultimate goal for us was not to be involved in Bible studies every week, even though that's a healthy thing to do. His goal for us was to follow him and fish for men. And then he goes on to say in the Great Commission, go make disciples of all nations. Through the Gospels, Jesus is very clear that we have a task to do. I don't know about you this morning, but this morning, in my quiet time with the Lord, I came expecting something from him this morning to this place in my own life. I'm a fragile, broken human being. And I pray that you came this morning expectant that God would do something in your life and that all of us would leave this place changed today. So as you open the word, I want to begin by praying and then we'll get into the the message that Jesus has for us this morning. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we... Father, I humble myself. And Father, I pray that your spirit, the spirit of a living God, I pray that your spirit will fall heavy on this place this morning. Father, I pray for those that are here this morning that have, that they have the ears to hear. The people in this room are spiritually open and spiritually sensitive for you to move in their lives. Father, we pray that you'll be honored in your word today. Father, may we, may we worship well today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn with me. To Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to tell you or repeat to you a simple story that Jesus told. And in my tram, my Bible, it says the parable of the sower. My notes in the margins say the four soils. So this morning I'm going to read um, to you Matthew chapter 13, 1 through 9. So let's do that together. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some seed fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, 
the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred and sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has an ear, let him hear. I want to begin by reiterating that, that final verse that I just read, he who has an ear, let him hear. This wasn't a call for everyone to listen. And rather, it was, it was a call for those that are spiritually sensitive and spiritually open to listen, understand, and obey what they've heard. What I want you to do if you have your program, there's a place, I believe, in it where you can take notes. And when we do this lesson across the continent of Africa, we do it in the simplest form possible because when you start getting too fancy, people say, oh, well, I can't do that, so uh, I won't participate. So if, you'll, if, you'll ha- if you have your br- uh, program out, um, there's a slide that we can pull up. It looks just like that. Hopefully you have something like that. And I drew that bird. Yep, I heard some of you laugh. Those are the artistic people that are laughing right now, okay? And then there's a path with seed on it. If you could just quickly draw that in, that top left square. Let's talk about the soil first. And here's what I've come to realize about this soil, this path, where these seeds have been dropped. The people represented are the people outside of this place this morning. They may have been exposed to the gospel in some way, some shape, form. They've sat in a church service, they've heard a radio, they've heard a revival, they participated in a Billy Graham crusade, I don't know. They've heard it, but the soil of their heart never accepted it. They're lost. You may be here this morning, you may have just wandered in off the street or you're from out of town passing through. Maybe this represents your soil this morning. You've been exposed to the gospel. But for whatever reason, You've chosen to do things your own way, to be your own God, to serve yourself. And all the while, there's this emptiness inside of you that you just can't seem to fill. Money won't uh, fill it up. A relationship won't fill it up. Your job, your exciting things that you do on weekends, they just seem to come and go and the void remains. And that's because the, the spirit of the living God doesn't live inside of you. And nothing can replace that. Or maybe, I think there's other people represented in that group as well, because I've experienced this a lot, and that's this group of people, people that are here every Sunday. You attend Sunday school, you may even teach Sunday school. You serve in all kinds of capacities. You participate in Bible studies, but when I read the passage to you from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I'm telling you this morning, if you've never experienced the new, then you're still living in the old. I've had this happen multiple times among youth. You know, the youth will go to a camp in the summer and they'll have a worship time and then you have 10 kids go down crying. They make some profession of faith with their mouth. They go back home from camp. Nothing in their life changes. They go back to the same language, the same jokes, the same behaviors they had when they went to camp. And it's because they've really not truly accepted the word of God in their lives. They've made some emotional appeal. But they're still lost. And what I realize in this group, and in many of the groups in churches on Sunday mornings, is what I realized as a father of three daughters is that if you're a teenager, 
If you're a youth, your parents' salvation does not cover you. You're not riding the coattails of your parents to heaven. Maybe you're still living in the old this morning. I don't know. You know. You've never experienced the transforming power of a holy God in your life. And I would beg you. I would plead with you not to leave this place this morning until you know. The second soil that Jesus explains to us, and what I want to do, I want to stop there quickly. And what Jesus, what Jesus does is he tells the parable, and then he gives the disciples an explanation of the parable. And then he reads, uh, or he says, verses 18 to 23. So let me read verses 18 to 23 for you to give this a little deeper context of what Jesus is talking about. 18 says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So that first soil, it might be you this morning. You've had the privilege, you've heard the gospel but for some reason you've allowed Satan to snatch that away from you. The good news is you can make it right this morning. There's hope for you. But it's only going to be found in Jesus. Now if you look at the slide and move to the next slide, another beautiful drawing. It's a wilted plant And the purpose of the reason for that being wilted is because the sun is just beating down on it. And if you read verses 20 and 21, it will tell us the reason that this soil is not fruitful. Now, what I, what I gather from this is these are external influences that keep us fruitless. They're external things. The verse says, when the sun came up, that's the heat of persecution. Some of us have experienced persecution for our faith. People have died as they've shared the gospel. People are being martyred around the world for the sake of the gospel. There are people that understand persecution much more than we ever will. There's other, others of in this group that have been persecuted, and because of that persecution, we've just like, we've gone underground. Like, we don't want to deal with that. I mean, that's, that's hard. Who, who wants to have somebody ridicule you or mock you? I don't like being ridiculed and mocked. I don't want anyone that enjoys being ridiculed and mocked. But even in the ridiculed and mock, being mocked, we cannot shy away from the proclamation of the gospel. We cannot.
And some people are so fearful of possible persecution that they never produce fruit. Because what we do is we say, well, what if? What if? What if? What if? And we convince ourselves that someone else would probably need to take the role of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's really not in our comfort zone. We're fearful of being persecuted. We're paralyzed by fear. Maybe that's your soil this morning. How do you know that? How, how would you know that? Well, do your colleagues at work know that you're a follower of Jesus? From personal experience, and I was a teacher back in the early 90s in a public school. Worked in this school for almost eight years. And I think one person knew that I was a follower of Jesus. I've lived this soil. I'm a great example of this soil. Am I, am I proud of that? No, I'm not. In that season of my life, the external influences dictated who I was in Jesus Christ. Do our neighbors know that we follow Jesus? Or are we just those people that hop in the car on Sunday mornings and leave and come back a few hours later? What about our classmates at school? Some of us have gone to the same high school for three, four, five years, and no one in our school knows that we follow Jesus, except the kids that go to church, we go to church with. If that's you this morning, external influences are dictating your fruitfulness. There's hope for you, though. There's hope for me. He who has an ear... Let him hear. In verse 22, Jesus talks about the internal. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. And in this picture, to be up on the board, it's another beautiful illustration, my very best, of a plant being choked out by thorns. And in this soil, this is what I see. This is internal influences that dictate our relationship with Jesus Christ. The thorny soil. You think about it. The worries of this life. Most people in today's society are consumed with the worries of this life. We worry about everything. We want answers to everything. We want to be comfortable. We want our kids to be comfortable. We want our kids to be happy. We worry, worry, worry about everything. In doing so, we become fruitless. There's no fruit to show from our lives. Another option would be the, the secret sins of our hearts. That sin that we think that no one else knows about except you and, and God. One of the greatest examples of that in America right now is pornography. It's eaten us up. And not just people out there, but it's also affecting people inside the walls of the church. Because anyone that has a smartphone has access. It's a secret but it's destroying us from the inside out. Maybe there's a struggle in your heart with jealousy or lust, or 
selfishness or pride, bitterness, anger. The list goes on, but you think about that. What, is there something in your heart that the Spirit is pointing out to you this morning that needs correction? It's because it's keeping you from being fruitful. And finally, let's look at the final soil of this passage. Jesus says, But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. The good soil. I don't know about you, but when I heard this lesson the first time, I was relieved when the guy finally got to that final soil because I was a wreck at first three. Because I could identify all, I could identify places in my life that I was all three of those first three soils. And actually, during that lesson, I identified the soil that I was that day, and I was embarrassed. As a missionary, I was embarrassed. So if you look at the, the, there are four soils, that's the final one. You think about the four soils for a minute. Three of them don't produce fruit. Only one of those four soils produces fruit. Only one produces fruit. All good soil produces fruit. Now, I'm going to give you the example of that, of, of, of a disciple of Jesus. Here's how it works. When I'm working overseas in an African context, I'll look at the person that invited me to speak, and I'll say um, to someone, uh, I'll say, Terry, um, thanks for inviting me to your house today for this meeting. I, I just want to say something before I begin teaching. He'll, he'll always like, yeah, and I'm like, I noticed as I was walking down your long drive that you had a massive avocado tree by the house. And as I got closer to that tree, I realized that that tree was growing bananas. And I'm not kidding. Terry will look at me like I'm crazy. Okay, because that's not possible. And everyone will look at each other in the room like I'm the crazy one, right? And then they'll finally say, um, no, that's not possible. Because avocado trees produce avocados. Okay, so if we follow that logic, if peach trees make peaches, right? Okay, if I say something wrong, you can call me out, okay? Cows produce cows. Ducks produce ducks. Humans produce humans. I mean, can you imagine just for a second, though, if that wasn't the case? Let's say you're going in for your ultrasound a few months before the birth of a child, and you go into the ultrasound, the doctor does the little wavy, wandy thing over your belly, and he says, well, congratulations, you've got four little rabbits in there waiting to come out. Like, wonder if you didn't know what was going to happen when you gave birth. Or an armadillo. Can you imagine the planning for an armadillo? Weird, Right? I'm just grateful in this process that our God is a God of order. He is. We should be thankful for that in that scenario. And I think about that, so if we follow that logic all the way out, cows make cows, ducks make ducks, humans make humans, what do disciples make? Disciples. Period. That's why Jesus said, go make disciples. That's the mission. And as we close this morning, at the bottom of your um, diagram, there's a circle, I think. Yeah, it looks like that. On that line, write your name. Just write your name there. And I'm doing it with you this morning exactly what was done with me a few years back. And my teacher, 
that taught me this said to me, Jeff, write your name on that line. And I said, okay. He said, now, around the outside of that circle, write down the names of the people that you've led to the Lord, been involved in their baptism, and been involved in their discipleship. Go ahead and write their names down. And I sat there. And I sat there. He gave me plenty of time. I just didn't need any time. I was finished when I started. And what he taught me that day was this. He looked at my paper. And he said, Jeff, where are your names? Where's your fruit? He said, I don't have any, even, I don't have, I don't have any. And then he wept, he wept for me. I've been calling myself a follower and disciple of Jesus for a really long time, and I had no fruit in my life. That day it broke me. I can't remember a time that I've cried that hard for that long of time over anything. My question for you this morning is if you're looking at your circle and there's no fruit around your name, you're one of those soils this morning. Which one is the Spirit saying that you are? I strongly believe that Jesus is going to return. I know that you do too. One of the things we say often where I work with my colleagues and people that I'm working to make disciples with is this. Jesus is coming. We need to get busy. We need to get, as the body of Christ, we need to get busy. So as we close this morning, I think we're going to have a time of prayer. And um, I don't know what the Lord's saying to you this morning. What I do know is He's spoken to me this morning. My heart has been challenged this morning in my own life. But this morning as we sing, um, we're going to have a time of invitation, and we're going to play some music, and I'm going to ask you to do something really hard that we don't like to do because we're afraid of who's watching and what people will say. If you recognize this morning that you're one of those first three soils, the altar's open. Come make it right with the Lord this morning. Don't worry about your spouse or your friends. You come make it right for yourself this morning so that you can be in right relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. If you're here this morning and you're like, you know, I don't know what he's talking about. I just know that there's something in me that's empty and I can't fill it no matter how hard I try. Friend, Jesus can fill that void. Come this morning and find out for yourself. Maybe there's sin in your life that you need to confess. Come kneel and confess your sins before the Lord. Come make it right today. Let's not leave this place the same as we came in. People are dying and Jesus is coming. We've got to get busy. We've got, as the body of Christ, we have got to be fruitful. So let's stand, I guess, and we'll sing together. This morning, if you need to talk to somebody, there's going to be people in the front waiting for you. I'll be in the front waiting for you. If you just need to, you just want to get cleaned up this morning, you want to get your heart cleaned up, 
I'm going to invite you to come pray at the altar. Make a bold statement about that you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You want to be in the game. So let's do that this morning. I'm going to pray and then we'll sing. Father, in Jesus' name. Hmm. Father, in Jesus' name, give us the church. Give us the courage. Father, give us the heart to pursue you at all cost. To pursue you above everything else. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. And for those that you're calling out, I pray they would come and they would not delay and they would leave this place changed because of your goodness and your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.